I'm Charles Bartlett from the University of Delaware. So something like this, a um, relatively unimpressive uh, delphacid, kind of on the medium size, uh, maybe slightly larger than medium size, a more or less uniform brown. And like I say, it's from uh, somewhere in Southeast Asia, probably, I think most of them are from Vietnam. So if you go back, once again, the couplet one, the calter, is it spine-like or is it flattened and tectiform? Um, the calcur is right in here. And when you look at it, you'll discover that it is flattened. It just, this one just happens to be curled up and I can see just right in there a row of black tipped teeth. Maybe just maybe I can find it on the other leg. And I can see it pretty well under the scope, but we're looking right in there. That's the calcar. And you can actually see the black tipped teeth along there. And this particular taxon, the calcar is pretty large and what I would describe as foliaceous. So if we Go back then once again to couplet one. Couplet one reads the postibial spur spine like or the postibial spur flattened, usually tectiform or foliaceous. And we're going to go on to couplet three because that's definitely the case here. So the next couplet asks about the nature of the um, sperm conducting tube and the adiagus. Um, I haven't pushed the adiagus out to it fully revealed, however, so this is the pygopher. This is uh, the paramires. Um, by the way, most of the, you know, nearly all the old literature calls them the genital styles instead of the paramires. I do that quite deliberately, and there's a side story that I won't tell you about, but I call them paramires, and you'll, most of the old literature will call them genital styles. The agus is right here. You can see it through the side wall of the pygopher and the tip of it, uh, which is pretty directly pointed, poking out right there. So if we read this, uh, adiagus with sperm conducting tube strongly sclerotized and clearly evident vestigial adiagal flagella may be present. Um, none of that will be true. Once again, we have a adiagus where the, the um, phallotheca has been fused to the adiagus, so you have a single structure. Um, only with some difficulty will you find the internal sperm conducting tube. Um, so all of that is going to direct us towards the Delphacini um, and not either the Stenocrinini or the Colossiani. So we'll move on to couplet seven. Couplet seven, once again, is asking whether or not this is uh, a stenocrinine. So fragile forms, usually green or yellowish green, ours with an acutely pointed head and lateral view. Um, absolutely none of that is true. Form various, usually stout, lacking the above features. And, and so on. So this is not Sarkara Sydney. This is in the tribe Delphacini, um, as essentially all our pests happen to be. So we move on to couplet number eight. Couplet number eight asks about whether the antennae are terique or flattened. get a frontal view of the head. Here is one antenna. Here is the other. And these antennae are terique. They're rounded in cross-section. They are not flattened at all like we saw in Perkinsiella. That sends us to couplet number 13. Couplet 13, first time we've seen this one, asks whether the fronds has distinct tips on it. Not spots, but tips. And if you look at the fronds, 
you will discover that the fronds is quite smooth. There are neither spots nor pits on the face of this. So in this couplet, uh, the fronds and vertex are without distinct pits. Now, let me just briefly say there are only two genera north of Mexico that have these pits, Lacocera or Lacocera and Acaratile. Um, both of those genera are common to the New World Temperate Zone and the Old World Temperate Zone. Um, neither of them are likely to show up in, in uh, uh, interceptions, port interceptions. Um, and because of those pits, they're very distinctive. So we're going to move on to couplet 15. Couplet 15 once again asked about the fronds. So if we look again at the fronds, the question is the median, uh, the fronds with two median carini or fronds, uh, the median carini of fronds single. So all you need to do is look at the median carini of the fronds and ask where is it forked? And the median crying of the fronds is actually forked way up here, uh, basically on the vertex or just barely anterior to the vertex. So in this case, the fronds has a single median carina, not a pair of median carini. So we're going to go on to couplet 19. Couplet 19 asks male pygopher with an elongate process or distinct median projection on or near the ventral opening. So again, we're looking, here is the pygopher, and I've got it, so you're looking at it kind of in slightly caudal view, and this is the opening. Um, if there were projections on that, you would see them. We can also try and rotate them, rotate it so we have a direct caudal view. So right here, this is the um, margin of the pygopher. And if we look at that, there are no processes on that part of the pygopher. And that is why I wanted to show you those on Perkinsiella, because there is nothing there. It's always the problem with a feature when it's absent is you don't know if it's absent or you're just not seeing it. So that puts us off to couplet number 28. Couplet 28 asks if the front and middle tibiae are expanded or not. Pretty straightforward feature oriented so you can see the front and middle legs or at least the front legs. So here we are looking at the leg, and there's the front tibia. And um, the front tibia, and if we could look at the middle tibia, we would decide that they are completely normal and not expanded at all. Um, what we just eliminated is the genus uh, Phylogenus, which is a monotypic genus, although there's a couple of old world species that are currently in that genus that don't belong there. Um, that brings us to couplet 29. Couplet 29 asks whether the fronds is spotted. And we've already kind of looked at this. Bring it back so we can see the fronds. And I would say that fronds is completely uniform in its coloration. It is not spotted at all. Um, it continues, the couplet continues and distinctly rounded on lateral margin. What that means, if you look at the lateral margin of the uh, fronds, that it would be that would be bowed out. But you can see it's parallel sided. Um, Clypeus at angle relative to the fronds. We um, that question of whether this part and this part are at different planes, and um, that's easiest to see in lateral view, but they're clearly not. So what we're doing now is eliminating the genus Bakerella. Bakerella is a very peculiar New World genus, um, uh, ver mostly very tiny, usually very vertiparous, um, mostly on sedges. And it's not something you really like to see, although there's an old world genus, Euconomelis, that would probably key out right there. So we go on to couplet 30. Couplet 30 asks, body somewhat to decidedly compressed. 
This is, in a way, tricky because you have to get kind of a feel for what that means. What it's asking is, if you look at it particularly in lateral view, is the body flattened? So uh, is it, you know, for example, wider than tall? In this particular case, it is not flattened at all. Usually when they're flattened, that the head is projecting. And this angle right here would be much sharper than that. But this is broadly rounded. Um, with head projecting in front of eyes or anglet and lateral view, none of that is true. Some forms decidedly slender. Um, none of that is true. So we're going to go with body not compressed, head and lateral view with fastigium, which is fastigium is the uh, inflection between the vertex and the fronds. Uh, fastigium is rounded, and head is not projected in front of eyes. That sends us to couplet number 35. Probably the steps we've taken so far, um, if you keyed out a lot of things if you're that, that are intercepted, all of what we've done so far will be the, the direction you'd probably go. So. Couplet 35 says, Kaltar lacking black tip teeth on posterior margin. So we can double check this feature if you want, but we know perfectly well that we saw black tip teeth earlier. So find the trailing margin of the calcar, and I can, I can see it right in here, and in this specimen, the calcar has little black tip teeth on the posterior margin. What we can, um, OK, so black tip teeth on the pa pa posterior margin and usually foliaceous. If we continue reading the first part of the couplet 35, calcar lacking black tip teeth on posterior margin, often short and thickened. Um, which is common among those groups that have, that lack teeth. Stout forms, um, very occasionally the teeth are hard to see. And sometimes when the specimen draws, dries, the calcar folds. So we have to be careful to find the, the trailing margin because sometimes that calcar is curled. And actually it's curled in the specimen that I'm looking at now. So Black tip teeth are present. That's going to put us to couplet 39. 39 asks whether the male paramires are distinctly branched. OK, I need to show you two things. So the shape of the paramires is an important feature. And with a little experience, you can recognize many of the genera based on the form of the paramere. Now, this is a different species in the same genus that we were looking at. And if you look, this is the paramere right here. And it's bifurcate kind of. So there's a broad piece right there. And there's another piece right there. So it looks kind of like a, a, a hand with a thumb. So. Here's one part, and here's the other. And you can kind of see the other. And it just rotated a, a little bit on me. Again, here's one part and the other. And I can rotate this a little bit back again. And if it will stay there for a moment. Here is one part, and here is the other. This is what is meant by branch. So apically, there's two or more parts. Now, this guy is the specimen we've been looking at. And it's a little challenging to interpret. What it's got going on is it's got you know kind of a broad thing, and then there's a little thumb-like thing, and there's a little bit right up there. Um, I would interpret this as branched. If 
but I'm going to have to explain that a little further momentarily because I'm teeing out something that will, that should properly key the genus and it's an important species to know in terms of interceptions, but it's also, as you notice from Vietnam, not north of Mexico. So we're going to go with branched on this. So male, male, male paramere is distinctly branched, either Y-shaped with inner and outer branches or multiply branched. So we're going to go with that direction. Um, most taxa is relatively large and uniformly colored. So we go to 40. 40 asks whether there's a distinct median fit up, something along the same lines as we saw in Perkinsiella. And once we get this back under the scope, we will see that the mesonotum is reasonably uniformly colored and there is no pale median beta. And if you give me just a moment, that would be as opposed to this situation where you clearly have it's dark laterally and white medially. So that's what we mean by a pale median beta. So the one that we're working with does not have that, and we can continue to read those other parts, but it's simply not there. So we're going to go to couplet 41. 41 is a very important couplet. It asks whether the first parsimere of the hind leg bears lateral teeth. And so to see this, we must very carefully find the first Parsimere. So this is the tibiae. Fur is going off away from you. This is the first tarsal segment, and right here are your teeth on the first tarsal segment. So this particular specimen is the genus Nyloprevata. Nyla pravata can always be recognized by the presence of teeth on the margin of the first tarsomere of the hind leg. You don't even have to go through all that if you think to look for it first on a uniformly brown specimen. With Nyla pravata lugens, the brown plant hopper, those spines are frequently quite obvious. But you do have to orient it just right because it's only on one side, it's only on one particular side of the basotarsus. And if you're looking at the wrong side, you won't find them. Now, this is the genitalia of Nyla pravata lugans, and the paramires are, have a peculiar shape um, in that the inner uh, angle of the paramires is strongly developed and pointed, the outer angle is weakly developed, and this adiagus has got this peculiar, uh, strongly tapered and strongly pointed arrangement. Um, None of the Nylar Pavada in the New World have anything even approaching this. And if you have a male Nylar Pavada, you don't even have to, to clear it. Uh, you can look at the hunt basotarsis and find those spines. And then look, if you've got a male, you can look at the paramires and see that it has this form. And then you know you have lugans. This Right here is one of our native Nyla parvata, endemic Nyla parvata. This is Nyla parvata serrata, uh, a species that occurs throughout the neotropics and kind of irregularly but widespread 
in uh, America, north of Mexico, and all of our species of Nyla parvata have the outer angle uh, longer than the inner angle, and none of that strongly pointed stuff going on. And if we turned it on its lateral view so you could see the adiagus, the adiagus has a very different form. Um, so that allows you to recognize Nyla parvata lugans as opposed to any of our native Nyla parvata or anything that, that's that similar. 